name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I had the Sunday off last Sunday from preaching as our youth did such a wonderful job of describing the mission trip. Uh, and I'm going to start with the most difficult part of the mission trip for me. And it's always uh, because my sense of self is so wrapped into my productivity. So the most difficult part is the fact they don't put me on a work team on purpose. In fact, my purpose of being there is, uh, is really not to get injured and to be able to be the spiritual leader for the week. Uh, but there's nothing more frustrating than being under the tent uh, for the, uh, the infirmary and seeing people on a roof or seeing people hammering nails and not going and grabbing the nails myself. Uh, and each year I get a little bit better, only a little bit better uh, from figuring out my own project, building a new addition that wasn't even planned just so I have something to do with my hands. Uh, but being still uh, and understanding that a good bit of the mission trip has nothing to do with what we build or accomplish physically uh, is very difficult for me. Uh, and I think that it clearly is very difficult for Martha as well. Uh, so a little bit about today's gospel. Today's gospel is a story that most people resonate with because they either identify themselves as a Martha, a doer, uh, or as Mary, a beer. And we get a little frustrated because Jesus comes down very heavy on the side of uh, Mary, the, the, the beer, uh, when many of us think that, boy, we sure need a lot of doers in the world too. Uh, and I think that we have to sort of look at this through the lens of the way that people understood it at the time. Uh, I liken it to the Beatitudes. When Jesus says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, everybody already assumed that the others were blessed. The whole archetype of the time was that if you were rich, you were blessed. God blessed you, and that's why you were rich and so-and-so wasn't. If you were well and healthy and not a leper or not uh, held outside the town gates, it was because God somehow favored you more than the other. That was the prevailing idea of the time. So Jesus isn't saying that these are the only people blessed. Jesus is just shifting the light so that people can see that, yes, Jesus loves and cares about the sick, the meek, the peacemakers, all of those people. And the same is true here. Martha is doing exactly what the world has told her she is supposed to do. She is fulfilling her role as, as, as host. She is fulfilling her role as a woman in the first century. She is doing everything according to the law. Social law, religious law, you name it. She is in tow. Mary is not. So when Jesus commends Mary for her part, it's not to the condemnation of Martha. We need doers as much as we need people who can be uh, and realize the moment that they are in the presence of God. Uh, and I think that's what's being celebrated. But a little more about the story. So Jesus is coming to town, and by now he's gaining popularity. Uh, and Martha somewhat caught wind of the fact that Jesus is on his way, but uh, Jesus didn't call ahead and say, you know, can we have dinner for 30, 40 of my closest friends? And, and so a whole bunch of uh, scraggly friends come with him. Jesus shows up, and Martha's thinking to herself, oh, my goodness, uh, how am I going to make food uh, stretch this far? And she starts putting on a stew, and she figures, well, maybe if I put enough water in and mix enough vegetables, we can make it spread out enough. I'll make a couple loaves of bread. Bread fills people up. Uh, and she's uh, thinking, uh, do I have enough silverware? Uh, what, about, uh, 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 what about the plates? Uh, how do I get all of these people fed? Why does it always seem to be more and more people? And why doesn't Jesus call ahead? She is losing it. She's the oldest. That's her job uh, in, the, in the family. And she's sitting here thinking, boy, it would be helpful if Mary would help me just a little bit. And realize her reputation's on the line. She's the one who deals with most of the family embarrassment if they, if they somehow fall short uh, and, and, are, and are horrible hosts. And sure, the story would probably be told differently if Martha said, you know, screw it. I'm just going to sit here and listen to whatever Jesus has to say. And uh, maybe Lazarus will take care of dinner. We'll see how that goes. So Martha is doing what she is supposed to be doing. But this is one of those moments where God is in your living room, not just in the, the presence of God is more palpable, but God is literally in your living room. And Mary realizes it. And she puts herself right there at the foot of Jesus, knowing this moment won't last forever. This is one of those moments where you stop what you're doing and you realize you're there in the presence of God, even if you're the only woman amidst a whole sea of men, even if you're breaking a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of social norms and taboos at the time, uh, even if everybody is looking at you and pointing daggers into your back because you're not helping Martha, because you're sitting there in, a, in the company of men, you realize 
Jesus is in your living room. And she responds. So what Jesus is commending, I think, is the fact that Mary understood the moment. And that Mary was being fed in a way that she wouldn't be able to be fed again in some, for some time. But not con condemning Martha. Uh, and I think that... Uh, that that's sort of where we need to, to go with this, is to understand that there are moments where we need to realize that God is washing over us, filling our tank, uh, giving us substance for the journey. And we know that Jesus, every time he had something difficult to do, every time he knew the world was going to challenge him and suggest that he needed to do something simpler, something otherwise, something less fulfilling of the gospel than all the way to the cross, he prayed. He dropped to his knees and he retreated and he prayed. I'll give you an example of two churches that I think prove that both are absolutely indispensable. So the first is a church in San Francisco, and it is a gorgeous church. Its congregation is made up of professors, of artists, of musicians. It is absolutely exquisite from the architecture to the way they do worship. Uh, their priest does liturgical uh, conferences all over the country, uh, and, and they are renowned for how beautiful their worship is. They have different hangings uh, almost on a weekly basis. It is every sense being opened up. They've got Tibetan drums, uh, colorful umbrellas. The procession somehow incorporates the entire congregation. They gather at the Eucharist, and then somehow they're swirling around the table. It is the most beautiful liturgical experience, uh, and people have come from far and wide uh, to experience it. Uh, but there's this woman who goes to that church for the first time. Uh, she is the grand child of missionaries, which meant her mom had absolutely nothing to do with the church and almost refused to ever step foot in the church, so she had no idea what church was. But she'd walk by this beautiful place uh, day in and day out, and something got her closer to the door each week until one day she walks into the door and she experiences this worship that washes over her, that fills her soul, that connects her to something that's been absent her whole life, and she feels like this is where she was supposed to have been her whole life. And when she is fed at the Eucharistic table, she says that she understood something about her identity that she'd never understood before. And she came back again and again and again, and it continued uh, to be a transformative experience in her life. Uh, but then she realized something. It was compelling her outside the doors, that she needed to do something, that, that all of that spiritual feeding compelled her to walk out and be God's hands and feet in the world. And so she decided it would be beautiful that if we could feed others the way that I have been fed at that table, it would look a lot more like Jesus. And so she came up with the idea to start a, uh, a feeding ministry, a, 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 a food pantry, and then uh, involved some, uh, some actually prepared food as well. And she said, wouldn't it be beautiful if it all gathered around the Eucharistic table uh, and we sort of represented everything we say on Sunday the rest of the week. And so many people got up in arms because it was a beautiful church and they were going to invite people who weren't all that clean into the church. And then it would be a mess. How do they get it perfect again for Sunday morning? And she kept pushing and pushing until they broke it open. And when there we have a church that was so centered on the act of worship that they forgot that it was supposed to push us towards a different kind of life, towards a discipleship, towards a transformation that is represented in the world. Then there was another church that was sort of the opposite. It did everything. It had a committee and an organization for every social justice cause, every outreach opportunity that they could possibly get their hands on. They were out and about in the community and they prided themselves on it. They looked at all the other uh, 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 nonprofits and they wanted to be as efficient and as good as any of them. And so they did and they did and they did again. Uh, and they worked so hard to be out in the community. Uh, and a bishop came and observed them and he said, I have one concern. He said, how much do they pray together? How much do they study and read and fill themselves up together. He said, this is wonderful, and it's exactly what we're called to do, but I don't believe they can sustain it without being fed themselves. That it gets difficult. We get dejected. We lose hope. And we need to have that touchstone that fills us with hope, that fills us with a sense of what the kingdom of God is like, that fills us with God's love for us so that we can share that with the world. And if you don't have both, you'll fall short. The Martha and the Mary. And so I invite us into that relationship. 
And I also look at this in terms of the rest of the whole chapter, that 10th chapter of Luke, uh, and how do we see this in concert with the other story? So we had the story of the 70 being sent out, and Jesus says, some people will realize that the kingdom of God is right outside their door, and they'll open it up and invite you in. Some people won't realize that God has come low, that God has come near, that God is right in their midst, and they will hate you, and they will reject you. Then we have the story of the Good Samaritan. The story where the first two uh, uh, people who, who found this man near death on the side of the road, uh, the priest and uh, the Levite of the priestly tribe both walked by without helping at all. Largely because they realized if the man was dead, they'd have, to, they'd have defiled themselves and they'd have to go back and they'd have to go through all of those pur purifying rituals all over again. And they had a lot of things to do and if they stopped, they'd be responsible and they couldn't just you know, halfway stopped, so uh, this could ruin their whole day and all the things that they were supposed to do, and uh, they had commitments to make, and so it was easier just to walk across the other side of the road, and the first to do that until the third, less captive from all of the doing, sees a stranger in need and meets Christ, meets his neighbor in the Good Samaritan. And then we have the story of Mary and Martha. And we realize it's not so much about one being better than the other, but about realizing that there are moments where Jesus is right in front of us. Maybe even in our living room, maybe in the stranger across the street. And we've got to stop, fill ourselves in order for us to go and do the work we're called to do. I'm struck as we gather here that we might be compelled to go outside these doors, but I'm struck by uh, Nelson Mandela, whose time in jail, he said, transformed him to be able to be the kind of leader that his nation needed. Uh, that at the time he was imprisoned, his anger and his singular focus about his people uh, was so sharp that he couldn't see beyond it to be able to minister to a nation in need. He said only those years upon years in prison allowed him to soften himself to be able to be a reconciler, a kingdom builder. Desmond Tutu, people who journeyed with him uh, from war zone to war zone uh, and asked him questions about how he could respond to violence uh, without violence himself, uh, didn't answer with a statement as much as the ritual that he uh, entered into as they were driving. He memorized the daily office. And so even when he didn't have a prayer book, whether it was with a journalist, a, a, a priest, or, or, or anybody who was in the back seat, they'd watch him as he invited them in to uh, pray the daily office before they went to a place that would challenge uh, their sense of justice, their sense of, of what God calls them to do, he would pray in the back of the limousine. And they said that's why he was able to look at violence, to look at people with anger in their eyes and hate uh, of, uh, uh, and, and respond with compassion. That's why he was able to listen to their story about why they felt the way that they did and respond in a different way. So as Christians, I invite you to come and be fed, to pray, to study, to fill your cup. It's only when that cup is spilled out into the world that we fully represent Christ. And I know it's not everybody's Euchar favorite Eucharistic prayer, but I want to close uh, with a line from my favorite Eucharistic prayer, Eucharistic Prayer C, because I think it, uh, it captures what I think uh, this moment is about, about us being filled, but not just for our own needs. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Amen.